In today's episode, we have Chip Candy, a Hall of Famer as a physical education teacher and a national presenter, and he's going to share how he became successful. Awesome. Well, hey guys, good to see you again and bring you the this week's pizza fun fact. Now, since we just had the Super Bowl, I thought it would be interesting to share with you that on Super Bowl Sunday, Pizza Hut sells and makes over 2 million plus pizzas. And as a bonus to that, Pizza Hut is a top selling chain in the United States. And I want our viewers to know, we do not get any sponsorship from Pizza Hut. <laughs> so, all right. So I cannot wait for our first, uh, or to introduce our guest. Um, he truly is a Hall of Famer. Some can, some may consider him like the goat of our PE profession. Um, he's from Medford Township, New Jersey. He taught in that school district for 37 years. He was a PE teacher, adaptive PE teacher, dance instructor. He coached soccer, track and field, cross country for over 44 seasons. I heard that he has presented over 500 training sessions. He is a national consultant, professional development trainer, all around amazing, humble gentleman who has really impacted impacted and influenced our health and PE world. I know that he's influenced my career. Um, I've learned so much from him. And I heard that he's right around throughout his career has influenced probably over 12,000 students. But what is remarkable to me is if you take his students that he's impacted, then you look at how he's influenced my teaching career, your teaching career, Kramer, Andrews, you can add up all the students that we taught. He has probably gotten into like the hundred thousands, millions of students because he is one of those presenters that anytime I go to a conference, if I see his name in one of the sessions, I'm going to it. I've seen him present numerous, numerous times, but every time I've seen him present, he always brings something novel and new. So let's invite him on to the show, Mr. The One and Only Hall of Famer, Chip. Candy! What's up, Chip? Hey. Sorry. What's it? Sorry. Dave Fletterman of Retirement PE with the uh, scruffy beard and the hair. I mean, you used to be a clean cut guy. You retire and you know now you look like Father Time. Well, <laughs> you realize with this pandemic, I'm staying home. There's not much I need. You know, if I'm not going out, the hair comes on. So. This is great. This is so cool. And you got a rocking chair, too. I mean, you're just living the good life. I know. Rocking chair and pizza. This can't get any better. This is so cool. Really looking forward to this. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. What kind of pizza are you eating? Uh -huh. Luigi's broccoli and tomato white pie. Oh, can't get better than that. Mm -hmm. I think you can. You just got to go up the road to New Haven. <laughs> no. No. Don't even go there. Okay. We've had first, this discussion. <laughs> all right, let's get to our very first question, Chip. Um, I'm interested in who influenced you and what influenced you to be a PE teacher. How'd you get started? What who impacted you or what impacted you? All right. So this is this is actually a really cool story. Um, my um, my dad. We I was born here in New Jersey. My dad was transferred down to Nashville, Tennessee. So my life would have been a lot different growing up in Nashville, Tennessee. We moved down there when I was four. Um, went to school down there. And um, my dad died while we were down there. Uh, he had skin cancer. So we came back when I was in third grade. And um, the, the phys ed teacher in my school, he knew, obviously knew what happened. And so he decided he was just going to take me under his wing. He was a young phys ed teacher, had, uh, was married, had two kids, uh, lived near the high school like I did. And he kind of took me under his wing and um, he took me all over the place, um, took me to high school basketball games, took me to wrestling matches, all, all kinds of cool stuff inside. Um, and he had two kids at home and he was doing this with me. Um, didn't bring his kids. He would just bring me. Um, but he also made me the... Um, the manager of the football team. I was the big deal in third grade. And I did that literally from third grade all the way to eighth grade. 
Um, I was the manager of the team. I'd go on away games. I'd go on the bus. Uh, my mother would let me go on the bus with these guys. I'd have lunches with them. I'd eat dinner. And the other guy who was there um, was the high school football coach, who was absolutely the legend, not just a football coach, but one of those people who just changed your life. Unfortunately, Tom McHugh just died two weeks ago. And I just, I, I've been writing about it. He was he literally was a legend who changed, you know, changed the course of my life. I mean, and many people will say the same thing. So I had all these phys ed influences in the beginning. And then I also had my my uh, high school soccer coach who literally plucked me out of um, out of a class to play soccer for him, uh, myself and, and my buddy, Timmy. And uh, we played soccer for him. And he he looked after me for years. Fast forward, I go to college as a bio major. <laughs> Why I went as a bio major, but I went as a bio major because I thought I was going to go into forestry. I came back after my first year, and um, the boys, the, those, all these guys I was talking to, they kind of took me aside in, the, in an office and literally without beating me to death, basically said, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to become a phys ed teacher. And so I did. And I never looked back, and it was wound up being the most important decision in my life. And obviously, um, you know, went on from there. So, so my, my soccer coach, he was not only my coach, he went on to become one of my best friends. And he taught me – let me get back to that number you were talking about. He taught me all kinds of stuff. But one of the cool things he taught me, and I, and I was terrible at it in the beginning, but he taught me how to juggle. So we often talk, like, you know, when you said about the 12,000 students – if, if everybody who's listening to this, is, if you're a phys ed teacher, figure out how many kids leave your school every year, multiply that times the number of years that you've been teaching, and you're going to find out how many kids that you've influenced. Now, figure out from there how many of them go on to do other things. So under me, there are a lot of phys ed teachers. Mm -hmm. just, they're just are going to organically be a lot of phys ed teachers. They've gone on to teach classes. Mm -hmm. Jim taught me how to juggle. He taught, he taught for 38 years. And taught juggling every year. So when you start looking at the scope of how it spreads out, it is scary how many people, everybody, not just me, everybody has what your sphere of influence is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we just took that juggling as one thing and we started to look at that and, and the numbers like our minds started to explode. We said, we, I, we can't even think that high. Like, you know, Jay Bird might be close. There might, I mean, as many phys ed teachers are in, under him and then under me and then Literally, they're now more under me. I mean, there, there could be, it has to be close to a million. It has to be close to a million, maybe more. We don't know. It has to. I mean, I just look at the numbers of my students who I've taught in my 26 years. Sure. And sure. the impact. Um, I mean, yeah. you, you truly, I mean, Chip, you, I mean, I really do consider you one of the goats in our profession. You really are one of the. What's well, because of this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, let me back up. So, it, it, that's that's great to say and I you know but you know there are so many others like when you talk about influencers like who has who has influenced me um who, other people I mean those I, I've gotten to see I've been pretty lucky that I've gotten to see the best of the best and because my district just allowed me to go and you know I, I would go to every conference that I could so early on in my career I got to see Carl Ronke who was really kind of the founder of adventure education he was, you talk about the goat, there's nobody, nobody who was the goat like him. Uh, I got to see John Hitchwa early on. John Hitchwa was, again, you talk about the goat, he's the goat of, you know, of everything. Uh, Don Puckett, I got to go see Artie Kamiya. I got to see Jim Rich, Larry McDonald, um, all these people. So you talk about influence. These, I, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. I am literally just a reflection of all these other people who, you know, I took, I just, I was like a sponge. I took everything from anybody. Um, and, and, you know, they were, they were the best of the best. So, but the, but the, but the best one, one more last one um, was Bob Lindgren. And you think, well, who's Bob Lindgren? Bob Lindgren was the art teacher in my school. Um, he was the best, one of the best teachers I ever saw. And I learned so much from him about how to actually teach, not about physical education, but how to teach and how to treat kids. He was, he was amazing, and he was sort of my mentor, and I got to watch him 
you know, and every day I would, I would almost every prep period, I just go in there and sit down and mess around with the kids and draw and do stuff with them. And he was unbelievable. So I, I really taught with not just him, but a lot of really great teachers. And I took the best of everybody. You know, I just, I grabbed whatever they were good at. I grabbed it and I ran with it. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, now Steve Chip, um, something you said in, in all that, and this, this makes me think, because to be honest with you, when I first applied to colleges, I wanted to go in the forestry as well. <laughs> really? That's funny. I did. And, um, uh, you know, I didn't get into the college I wanted to. And I, so I went to Coastal Carolina. And that summer that I was at, first summer at Coastal Carolina, I worked a baseball camp. Mm -hmm. And I was put with the youngest kids. They would be like kindergarten, first grade kids. And, you know, I here I'm 18 years old. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I, what do I know about teaching these kids? But it was during that camp where I saw light bulbs go off just on simple throwing technique. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I've had some really cool PE teachers in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, a lot of times that's who we remember the most because that was the class that we enjoyed the most. Yep. I said, I think this is what I want to do. And from there, I jumped into the PE business. That's funny. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've been in this for, for 20 years. And, you know, it just really started presenting within the last five years or so, you know, and um, it, heck, it, in, in my world, one of the coolest people I've ever gotten to work with currently, but also watch is Kim and um, getting to see her present. And she's taught a lot about presenting. So I guess this will lead me to a question of at what point in your career did you start presenting and sharing your content with the world? Because, hey. You know, it does me no good to keep it here and share it out. But then, you know, you're such an amazing presenter. And, you know, I know that my struggles in the beginning of getting over the the, the scariness of being in a room and trying to present your to your peers, you know. So, but it takes some time. And, you know, I'm still not as good as you are at this because you've done this for a long time. But, I mean, what do you think, you know, makes a good presenter? And at what point do you think people should maybe even start presenting? Okay, that's that's a really good question, and it's got a lot of a lot of facets to that star. So, when did I start? Okay, I started probably um, early '80s, and I started almost by accident. Um, so, I, I'll give you the quick story. So, um, my my buddy, the art teacher Bob Lindgren, he had uh, um, a parent who said, "Hey, we ha we owned a movie theater, and the movie theater just went out of business." So we have, we have these, we've got cases of popcorn buckets. And he said, oh, great. I'll put paint in them. Well, guess what? Popcorn buckets are not waterproof. So <laughs> the first time, first time he tried to put paint in them, they went all over everywhere. He was like, oh, get these things out of here. Well, he had a small closet. So he asked if, I, if he could put it in my closet, which wasn't that much bigger. So I was like, yeah, put them in there. So they sat around for like two years. And one day I was actually cleaning and I, which was a, a never happened. And I pulled them out and I just, I, I started messing around with them. I started, you know, bouncing a ball and catching it and flipping them and catching it and catching it on my head and doing. And so we started doing this in class and, and it just went on and on and on and on and on. And then all of a sudden I realized that you could use them for bowling and you can use it for targets. And then we started making, I started, I had enough to literally fill my entire gym with a scooter course. And I think there were close to 2000 buckets. Um, and I would get it. I would get in early every single day and everybody thinks you're crazy. Why would you do this? Well, because it was easy. I would set up all these buckets and then every class just came in. And I was like, okay, start over here and you end over there. And in between there's all kinds of stuff that you had to do. Like you had to get off. And I had, I, I, I assigned um, fire and police. Like if somebody was going too fast, the, the police could come and get them and hook them and get them off the course. I had fire people. So in case something got knocked down, they would go and they would refix it. And uh, I, had, I had two ambulances running in and out in case there were any accidents on there. They would pull them out. And it was just a riot. Well, somebody heard about it and they said, you know, you should go present that. Well, I didn't even know what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. So. So I said, okay. 
So I went to this conference and uh, it was, it was our state conference. It was the New Jersey AFER conference. I had no idea what I was doing. I went, I, I told the people at the desk who I was and they said, okay, yeah, you're in there in like an hour. Um, there's nobody in there so you can go set up. So I brought my buckets in. I set the whole course up and uh, showed everybody the course and a bunch of people came and a few people played and, and I left. I didn't know I was allowed to stay. I didn't know there was anybody else there. I had no idea what it was about. So after that, somebody asked me to do another session. And then all of a sudden I started to realize, oh, I can stay at these things. And so then I started to go to watch people. And so it was really kind of an accident. Um, so that, that's how I started. And then from there, um, I was, let's see, I don't know. I, I don't even know what my first next few conferences were or how I got out of state. I think I started going down to North Carolina. I was asked at a beach conference. and then. Um, our, our, we had a couple of other crazy conferences in New Jersey and I went to the camp Caesar in West Virginia and, and, and eventually I was picked up by a guy, um, who, who did, he was one of like, just, just like Artie Camille, um, Cliff Carnes used to run, uh, phys ed programs all over the country and I got picked up by him. And so next thing I know, I'm on the road presenting for Cliff Carnes, uh, his education company. And, um, and so that got me literally all over the whole country and I didn't have to do anything. I literally just, Cliff would just send me and I would go. And, um, Artie had his group here in the, in the East coast, which was Artie, Larry Mack, um, and, uh, Jim Rich. And, um, then Cliff was in California. So we worked for him in California and we'd do a lot of stuff. So that's how I started. Um, now as far, the next question I think you asked was about good presenters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So what, let, let me ask you, each one of you tell me, what do you think? Give me a, give me what you think a good presenter is. And I'll, I'll give you my list. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I What's guess that? I'll start with that since I asked the question. I think somebody who's dynamic and fully engaged with the people. So like when I come to watch yours, you're out there, you're animated, you're in there and it, it, it just, everything flows. And even if you were to like miss something or mess something up, Nobody can tell because of how dynamic and how how just everything just looks and and feels, you know, because I've been in some where the presenter just stands up there with a piece of paper and they're kind of reading stuff off to you. And it's kind of you know, scripted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, it's somebody that's fully engaged and and just really dynamic and and they're as excited about teaching the content as they are you learning the content and doing it. And then being able to sit back and you, I, I've been next to you at some of these conferences during a game where I've sit back and we've we chuckled at some of the people playing, you know, and that, that's for me, that's one of the things I look, you know, I like about a presenter. Yep. So for me, Chip, I think it's also where it's relevant and applicable mm -hmm. to, to go into the school setting. Like I remember watching you and, and learning some games and back in the day when you went to conferences, you had to participate to get the handout. Mm -hmm. It wasn't posted online later on. So I always participated because I want to dive in. The presenter usually at the end would say, well, here's a hundred handouts. And everybody would just flock and try to get their handout. Yeah. So I would have binders and binders of some of your handouts. And I could not wait to take one of your games that you taught me and teach it the very next day. Yeah. So I want to see where it was instant, be able to go from you as a presenter to me teaching this to my students. And I also thought that you as a good presenter was your instructional delivery and how you engage and you really made eye contact with every person that was in the room. Yeah, I agree. I'm gonna piggyback on something that Kim just said about being fully engaged and grabbing the audience's attention right away. To me, that's, you know, that's something that you do immediately. And I love the novelty. You know, you always bring something new and creative or good presenters bring new and creative ideas based off of something they may have seen before, but they add a twist. Mm -hmm. I love twists to activities. Mm -hmm. It's like when you sit back and think, you, oh, I can do that. I can also do it this way and this way and this way. So you're not only giving us information, you're allowing us to think, you mm -hmm. know, as presenters to come up with new and innovative ways to teach things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really spreads and really helps the PE community is all the different ways you can do things. Yep. And I love that. Yep. All right, so 
I'll give you my brief answer too. Um, I think first thing is, yeah, I want content, but I want, I want content. I think, like you said, that I can take back like tomorrow. I want to, it's so good. I want to take it back. I'm like, my kids are going to do it the next day. My kids knew when I went to a conference, they knew like the next day, like they're, they, at, at, they, they all, if, if I had them for two or three years, they would say, all right, what, what are we doing today? We know you just went to a conference. What's, what's up? And there would be something new for sure. Um, and, and also I want it so good. So that when I'm leaving a conference, I'm looking for kid on a playground to go do it like immediately. Like I want to go do that right away. Um, um, so did you do that? Well, yeah, yeah, we, we, we did it. Well, we, we got stopped one time and away from West Virginia and we're dancing on the road, but that's <laughs> the whole story. Um, <laughs> we made circle back to that one. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to see too, I want your personality. Like if I go to see you present, I want to see you. Like I, I, I don't want, um, I don't want anything canned. I don't want a canned session. I don't want, I don't want somebody who looks the same as somebody else or somebody else. I want like what I want to know, like, what are you in the classroom? Who are you in the classroom? What, is, how do you teach? I want to see how you teach it just as much as what you teach. Um, and that, and that like is in the, just in the basics of starting and stopping the class. Um, uh, just how you interact with, with people, like you said. Um, so I want to see that part of it. Um, I, you, what's, what's your, what's your personality? I, I also want to see a person who presents what they actually do. I don't ever want to see a presenter present something that I can tell, like, you've never even taught this before. You know, I, I don't want that. I don't want them teaching some, if, if you, if, if I want to see that like this was good in your class. And I always say, you know, in my school, if it, if it ain't fun, we ain't doing it. Um, and the, and it, and it was true. And it's the same thing. I would always say in my, in most of my sessions, I would say, look, this stuff is, is kid approved. And it's, it's, you know, if it, if it's something that kids don't like, I'm not going to sh- do it again with them. And I'm certainly not going to show it here. This is stuff that my kids do and my kids like and my kids, you know, and, and there were times when I would tell my students before I left, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I have to present. Tell me what I need to present. And they were like, noodle hockey. You have to do noodle hockey. You've got to do this. You've got to do. So they would tell me what I would have to present, which was, it was an interesting one. Um, I, I want your, I want their best stuff. Like, don't give me what you're okay at. Like, the best possible stuff that you do. That's what I want to see. I, I don't want something that is, um, again, it's, it's canned. I want it to be um, things that, things that you are really, really, really good at. Like what is your best? What are you really good at? And I, and the, the idea, I, I saw this, this crazy thing that you have to be a great presenter to present, I think is nuts. Um, I think that I would just want to see a good teacher. Um, and if you're not a polished presenter, that's okay. I want to see, again, I want to see you as a teacher. And I think sometimes we put pressure on people um, to not present because they think they've got to be a polished presenter. None of us were polished presenters. It's no different than teaching. We weren't polished teachers. We were horrible when we started. So, it's the same thing. We want to have this presence um, that we, we, we want to invite people. We want to invite people to present is probably the best way to say it. We want it to be open so that everybody can present. Um, and that's, I think that's, you know, that's really important. Share your passion, share your enthusiasm, you know, share the fun and, and have fun. And it's more, it's not, you know, it's not about, it's not necessarily about the product. It's about the process and how you get to it and the fun you have. Yeah. It's funny you say that because it, there is a lot of times where you go to a conference and you do see some people that are presenting that you wonder, is that exactly how they how they yeah. present to their kids? Yeah. And I can tell how bored I am sometimes with their presentation. I can absolutely see a kid being like, hmm, 
it just wouldn't be done. You know, and, and that's that's very true. And I, I do agree that you have to have your personality in there, and it has to be your best stuff. So it's a whole lot of presenting to your peers than it is to, to the kids. See, I don't know about that. I well, think I would say that. But to me, it's teaching. Teaching is teaching. Whether you're teaching adults or teaching kids. And that's what I want to say. I want to see how you teach. You're just teaching adults. I I don't know. I wonder if it's because you know, they're more, they don't want to show like that, that side of them. Yeah. Like adults. Yeah. So, Chip, I mean, we can all agree that we're going through some difficult and challenging times right now with, with COVID and, and everything that's going on. And so, not only to add to the stress of COVID, but also teachers are stressed out just through the daily grind, day in and day out, right? So we also know that one of the biggest things we hear, too, is, you know, teachers get burned out. They get stressed out to the point where they need the career or they have to take some time off, you know, and for various reasons. So, you know, how how did you avoid that burnout stage in your career? Okay. Now, you realize that that question, we could probably go for a good three-hour, four-hour podcast just on that question yeah. alone. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, first of all, I think I I tried to hang with the positive people. So I tried to have the influences on me to be the positive people. If they were negative people, I just I didn't want to eat lunch with them. I didn't want to hang out with them. I, I want I want to be with the positive people. Now I want to try to influence those negative people, but I wanted to be hanging with the positive people. Who are the people who are going to bring the fun and the uniqueness and the, just the joy of teaching every day? Who were those people? And so that, I think, is that's a biggie. Um, a friend of mine got burned out, and he was, he was, he was done. He was a high school um, teacher, high school phys ed teacher. He was a football coach, and he just hated life. He did not like it. So they finally went to him and said, look, you're, you're, you're either going to get fired or we're going to move you to the middle school. He was a little bit short of being um, ready to retire, even though he was ready to quit. They moved him to the middle school, and guess what? He absolutely loved it. In fact, so much so that he said, you know, I'm going to try this again. So a couple of years later, he moved down to elementary school. Well, here's this nasty football coach, horrible you know, teacher, and he, he'll tell you this, moved down to elementary school. And now he's hugging little kids and, you know, and it, it, it not just changed his teaching, but it changed his life. So for me, I got to change three times. I started in elementary. I moved up to, to middle school and then I moved back to all and all sixth grade school. So I don't think it's bad to move around and try some different stuff. You get a whole new perspective of things. None of them are better or worse. They're just different. They really aren't. High school is no better or worse than elementary. Elementary is no better than, you know, because I coached at high school level and even college. I I've, I've did some college uh, teaching stuff. None of it's different. It's I mean, None of it's better. It's just different. Um, I think the other thing is that you got to get out of your gym. You've got to go see other stuff. You've got to talk to other people. Um, I I didn't become a good teacher until I saw other good teachers. You know, that's the only way anybody gets to be a better teacher. Um, and you, you aspire to who these other people are. I mean, I, like I said, I got to see some unbelievable. I, I can remember seeing a guy named Lee Osbrook from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Lee Osbrook was, he was amazing, absolutely amazing. And, you know, you'd leave there and think, man, I'm terrible. This is, I'm awful. But I got to take a little bit of Lee Osbrook. And then I'd go see, um, you know, Whoever, uh, Carl Ronke, like I said, and, and you just think, there's no way I, anybody's ever going to be Carl Ronke, but I can take a little bit of Carl Ronke and, and do that. Um, the other a couple other things, um, I, I would wake up every morning and say, I got to remember that I don't have to teach today. I get to teach today. I, mm -hmm. And I want to teach. You know, I don't have to. I could quit if I want to. But I get to do this every day. And, and you know, I say this in conferences all the time. If, you know, if you want to go down to the math workshop, we're more than happy to let you go down there. 
But you know what we're going to do in phys ed. We're going to have fun. You know, I mean, I could be stuck behind this computer all day long and just just grind my brains to, to mush or I could teach what I'm doing. So I don't see how you could burn out when you have an attitude where you think, this, I just, this is so much fun. Well, how, why would I do anything different than that? Um, and that's the other thing is focus on fun. I, I literally, if, if, if I was having a bad day, I'd flip this, flip the switch and we'd go, I'd do some crazy fun activity that I knew was just going to be crazy. That, you know, another, what just came to my mind is music. Oh yeah. I just throw music on and that could change my whole, my whole day. Um, uh, I, I would, I, I, another thing that I always say is, you know, remember not to let a student ruin your day. Don't let a parent ruin your day. Don't let another teacher ruin your day. Don't let a, just close the doors and be in there with those kids. You know, I, I always figured no matter what happened, I'm just going to close the doors and it's just going to be me and y'all. We're, <laughs> we're going to go so out. In Jersey, huh? Yeah. Well, we y'all. We're going to go when it was just us, it was going to be y'all. <laughs> it was just going to be all of us together. Like, let's, let's just have fun today. And we would just, I'm just, you know, whatever we were teaching that day, if, if we didn't get to it, hey, we didn't get to it. We're just going to have fun today. And we're all going to have fun. And the other thing sometimes is just admit, like, hey, I'm having a bad day. Let's, you know. Let, what do you think? Let's let's do something different today. Um, a couple more. I think remember that you're going to a job, and when you leave it, when you leave phys ed, when you go home, remember that you're going home. Um, don't don't bring a, a ton of work home. There, are, I know there are a lot of people right now who are spending hours and hours and hours on the internet, looking for stuff, creating stuff, doing stuff. But you know what? That that can lead to burnout. It's just it's too much. I focused on my kids in my school and yeah, I did a lot of extra work and did, but you know, I knew I had to come home. I had two kids at home and I had a wife at home and you know, I, I, I you know, I had, I wanted to go home and do, get a run in, you know, I had mm -hmm. to focus on my own health sometimes. Um, I think the internet right now is leading to a lot of people kind of getting burned out. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, I think the other thing is, to help other people, like it's not about me. Help other people. You know, work work with other people. Do whatever you can to help other people. And I think last one for me would be um, doing like extra. I don't know how I put this. Extra events, like different weird stuff. Like we um, we raised money and did like a twenty four hour uh, marathon, uh, and the whole school was involved in it. And the kids were there. They could stay till ten o'clock at night and come back at six in the morning. But there had to be people running the whole time. So myself and three or four other people, we would sleep at the school and we'd run through the night. We did that one. That would raised all kinds of money for uh, actually one of our one of our uh, teachers who was uh, had cancer. Um, we did um, we did a twenty four hour uh, we did a lock in with our with our I guess it was our eighth grade class. Yeah, it was our eighth grade class. So we did a lock in with this eighth grade class. It was the craziest night ever. Like at two, two o'clock in the morning. We started the we started the dance at two o'clock in the morning. Um, the other thing, I, I, I think, the other thing would be to try, like try stuff. Just do other stuff. Get out of your comfort zone. Don't do what you've always done. Do new stuff. Try different stuff. Um, I went and started. We at my school there was this guy who who had a square dance every Friday night. So we would go as a group. There were a whole bunch of us. We'd go and do this square dance, and the place was packed. And he. It was the crazy price of two dollars per person, and he would feed you, like his wife would bake. So for two dollars a person, you go for two and a half hours of square dancing. Well, after a while, you start it starts to get into your, you know, like you know what he's calling. Next thing you know, I'm calling square dances. I become a professional square dance caller. This guy <laughs> gives me he gives me his equipment, and I literally became a professional square dance caller. And <laughs> did square dances. I taught square dances for and still do for probably 30 years and it was all because of dave ainsworth funny story about that one day our secretary comes in and she says man you sound a lot like my father and i said really who's your father she said dave ainsworth i said dave ainsworth he's that's why i do this i learned from your father i was in your house this is his daughter and wow we've been working together for years and here 
her dad is Dane's, Dave Ainsworth, who did my wedding, by the way. We had a square dance and a DJ at our wedding. Uh, 350 people at a square dance. It was crazy. But he taught me how to, how to, how to do a square dance. And I, he literally, I bought my equipment, my first equipment from him. So I think you got to get out of your comfort zone and do it. One more thing with the Dave Ainsworth story. I'm, I'm doing my last event at school. I got my DJ equipment. We're doing some, we're doing some dance. I think it might've even been a dance and her, she brought her dad. And her Aww. dad yeah. I'm going to be in tears now. Her dad comes in, gives me a hug, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is full circle. Yeah. It would not be cooler. I was like probably five or six days away from retiring, uh, being done. And here comes Dave Ainsworth in with his, you know, with, with, his, uh, with his daughter. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so awesome. So you got to get out of your comfort zone. Do cool stuff. Try new stuff. You know? So, Chip, like, so ultimately, movement, music, novelty, it's all medicine. Right. Right. Taking a dose of medicine, but it's taking it in a natural way. You know, yeah. so we always say that movement is medicine. It's yeah. it's bringing out all the good, the feel good chemicals, all that stuff to make us happy, excited, and wanting to to keep going to avoid that burnout. That's yeah. those are awesome tips. Yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, Chip. I have a question for you. Um, when I first started, so I think you experienced the same thing. I did not have the internet to search for games. I did not have social media where people are sharing and collaborating lesson ideas. How did you come up with your lesson ideas um, and lesson plans, your games and activities? Can you walk me through that process? Sure. Well, you, you, you know what the answer is. The answer was simple. We went to conferences. I mean, we went, went to go see people. So I'll give, you, I'll give you my story. This is a funny one. I, um, I was teaching. I was probably in my second month or so of teaching. My principal, who had never hired a new teacher before, was looking at me and behind closed doors, she's thinking, this boy's not going to make it. He's terrible. And probably I was pretty bad. And uh, she basically came and said, listen, you need to, as soon as, as, soon as something comes across your desk, um, you need to go to the first conference or whatever comes across your desk, go. We'll pay for it. You go, we'll go do it. The first thing that came across was the New Games Foundation. Um, they were a bunch of hippies from out of San Francisco who basically said, you know what we're going to do? You were going to play games just to play games, just have fun. And so I went and I think I went for four days and I became a New Games instructor, a certified New Games instructor. And that was the beginnings of, by the way, part of Project Adventure. Many of the Project Adventure games came from the New Games Foundation. Well, from there I realized, I, I, I went back and I said, you know what? This is about having fun. And so I completely changed literally overnight. And I realized this is what was going to change me. I, I had to get out. I had to go see other people. So the, you, have to, you had to go see other people. And, and, and I tell you what I'm really good at. I'm really, really good at this. I'm really good at not creating my own stuff. But when I see somebody else's stuff, stealing it, and then w- making it work for my kids, like changing, tweaking it, doing whatever. So original content probably came out of, again, some other stuff. Um, did we talk about hashtag? No, no. So okay. I'll give you an example of that one. So um, one day, uh, but let, let me back up. So another another way that you do this, and we'll get back to hashtag. Another way to do this was we used to get together with friends. So we would have we had these these groups of friends who would get together, and we would just say, "Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you?" And we would just make tweaks. My friend Jim Ross, there's a, a game out there that's uh, basically called Three Passer, and and Three Pass. It's just one, two, three passes. And then the other person has the ball and they've got to go find somebody one, two, three. Now they get rid of the ball and they go find somebody else. And, and you just do this three pass game. Well, Jim came up with it and he, his, his game was four pass. Well, <laughs> we realized it was better at three pass because at four pass, it kept coming back to me. And I have, so I kept having the ball all the time. And so anyway, we would collaborate and the boys that I collaborate with were the Jersey boys. Um, and oh, they're okay. three of my best friends, Jim Ross, John Smith, and Greg Montgomery. And the three of us would just get on the phone or get together at conferences and we'd talk and just 
we'd come up with stuff and I'd see Greg do something and I would add 15 things and send it back to him. John would see Jim do something and he would add 10 things and send it to all of us. And it, so we were just constantly sharing stuff. So you have to meet other people. So Project Adventure, they do that all the time. Like they'll just spend a day and they'll just have a think tank. They'll just sit around and shoot the breeze and talk about content. And uh, so one day they were cracking up, they were laughing like all day. And they said, we were laughing about this game that we came up with, but we didn't have the game. All we had was the name. We wanted to name it hashtag. Well, we're like, yeah, that's, 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 that's cool. Like hashtag, but they couldn't figure out how to play it. So they called, called me and they said, look, we have this stupid game called hashtag, but we don't know how to play it. So use your kids and trigger, try to figure it out. Well, we could not figure out a fun way to do it. And I was working with um, the health teacher who was in my school. We would, we were both involved at lunch. We had all of our kids at lunch and, and uh, she was involved with me. And uh, the two of us were working on it and working on it. We couldn't. So finally, I went in and I got three chalkboard erasers and I brought them out. And um, I said, you know what? Let's play selfie tag. If you get knocked out, you got to go take a selfie with somebody. Well, we started, we were almost doubled over laughing. We were having so much fun with selfie tag. And eventually, some one of the kids ran into the, into the closet, pulled out a pool noodle and had a selfie, like a selfie stick. <laughs> He was getting like 20, 30 people in his picture. Like they were all people who now wanted to get knocked out of this tag game so they could come over and get in these pictures. Well, then we actually brought in cameras and we took selfies and we were posting these selfies and it just was just this big thing. So, you know, ideas and those types of things all came out of stuff that you heard or see from other people. And you just, you just try stuff, um, you know, a piece of equipment, like there were we had those foam dice and we did the cone knockdown and cone setup and all those different weird games with those. Um, I, I was watching, uh, I was listening to a radio show. I was cooking. I, I for two years, I baked soft pretzels in the morning before I'd go to school. My buddy opened a factory and I helped, I helped him. And one day, I, well, not one day, I, it was every morning. I was listening to the radio and they had this great game called the ah, um, pause game. And what you did was, they would call up and they'd say, hey, this is radio, whatever the station was. Um, we're going to play the ah, uh, um, pause game. Here's the way it's played. We're going to give you a topic. All you have to do is talk on it for one minute. You can't say ah, you can't say um, and you can't pause. Ready? Here's the topic. Name things, uh, name your favorite vacation. And the person would start to talk and they'd go, uh, boom, done. <laughs> or they would, they would get literally, I, I rarely, there was rarely anybody who ever made it one minute. So we just turned it into a into a game in, in school, and we called it the ah um game. So, you know, you look for ideas wherever you can, and you just, you know, so I don't know, like, okay, so what, Kim, where did, what did you do, like, early on? What did you, how did you get your ideas? How did you make curriculum up? Same thing, conferences, going to see you. And yeah. then um, I think you brought up a good point about the equipment. When I saw a, a really cool novel piece of equipment, I was like, I have to incorporate this into my PE games. Sure. So I sometimes got the inspiration through the piece of equipment itself because kids were like, what is this new shiny object? This is cool. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, that's how, that's awesome. Chip, I mean, like I said, I think you are the, the king of novelty. Oh, you need more pizza? I, I do. I'm ready for some more pizza. I don't know about you. Okay, well, let's grab a slice and let's come right back. Okay, sounds good. I'll be, I'll be back. I'm going to get mine. Okay, real quick, real quick. Yep. I'm going to go grab some too. Oh, this is a good one here. This is good. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Hold on. I've got to say this, right? Grandmother's pizza I've here. I've lived in Connecticut. I've lived in North Carolina. And, you know, a pizza combo is a pizza and like a soda, a pizza, garlic nuts, and a soda. What do they have in Jersey? A pizza and a shave because you come back from getting a slice of pizza and you're shaved. Or was there something definitely in the water there in Jersey that's not good if it's going to take all that, knock all that hair off your face? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, baby. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I think he did get a razor with that pizza. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys have to, for those who are listening, you have to go to our Train EDU YouTube channel or just search pizza and PE and, uh, See kind of uh, Chip Candy and how he's transformed himself from 
beginning of this episode to the intercession and while he took a break from getting a slice of pizza. It's quite remarkable. Maybe he's going back into teaching. Well, we literally just watched him go back in time. <laughs> yep. <we did. laughs> I tell you what, I'm not sure if I'm ready for a slice from Jersey yet, if I'm going to lose all this hair on top and on my face that quick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let, you know, Chip, I'll get back into this little conversation we're having. And it's, it's funny. A lot of times we, when I see you uh, present, you know, people always want to bring up, you know, one of those popular terms that we throw around in education every couple of years. And one of the things that's always popping up, especially recently, is SEL. And how do we do it? How do we get this? But you know, and you've been saying this as PE teachers, it's, it's ingrained it in what we do. So, you know, let's say we're, you know, if, if an administrator or a teacher comes to you and go, well, what are you doing to, you know, address it? Yeah. Address it. Yeah. Well, tell them, I would tell them, you know, come to class, come to class with me and you'll see it. It, it, it's just it's organic. It naturally happens in class. If you're running, if you're running a um, a class that is safe and is inclusive, then you're doing SEL every single minute of every single day. So what is SEL? Well, basically it's team building. It's bringing people together. It's basically learning how to get along with each other. Well, that's what we do in phys ed. I mean, whether we're working competitively or cooperatively. Um, we're working on social emotional learning all the time. Now it's just the idea of a teacher fostering that and saying, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. I'm and pointing it out when we see it. Um, and again, uh, you know, no matter what, no matter what style we're doing, whether it's competitive or cooperative, it's how we, how we deal with each other um, and, and just our interactions with each other. And so what we have to do is, is figure out what's the best way for us to get that to happen. So then you start working on uh, project adventure type activities where you can bring that together. Um, but it, it literally, it happens in every single thing we do. I mean, do you not agree that it's like, it's just ingrained, that's what we do? I, social learning is what we do. Yeah, and it actually, it's sort of um, for myself, it, it sort of, well, I don't get enraged, but when we talk about school districts that are buying million dollars worth of SEL curriculum and they're not investing in quality PE with funding for equipment and for resources and more time for PE, I think that's where I get a little um, heated. Mm -hmm. Or I'm like, PE is SEL, a quality, now I say quality, PE program mm -hmm. is the best kind of SEL resource for our kids. Mm -hmm. Do you think, though, it, that it's also lost with some of our, especially our new kids to this profession, is that they don't know how to elaborate that what they're doing is SEL. And because it's not thrown at them in that box type way or because it's not from some specific person in the school that they don't really realize it. So when somebody comes in, the principal, you can say, look, I am doing it. Mm -hmm. this yeah, I think the other thing is um, the way that you structure your class and some of the some of the things that you do in class fosters it no matter what. Um, mm -hmm. Give you some examples. Um, no laughing policy. No way should any student in any class in physical education ever be laughing at someone else. And I see it happen all the time, and it should just never happen. Um, the worst place is, as an example, that I always used to see it was in dance. You know, somebody would be struggling with dance, and you'd get some students laughing at them. Well, what do you think that just did? Right. For the rest of their lives, they're never going to dance again, you know, unless you get them, unless you can keep them somehow or teach them somehow and get past that. Because as soon as somebody laughs at you while you're dancing, you think, you know, you go home and you look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, man, I'm, I look like a total spaz. And, I, you know, I'm just I'm terrible at this. And so you don't you can't ever have a laugh. So it's, it was never we, we would never allow that. Uh, obviously, a no bullying policy. You know, as soon as you hear something like that. And I, that's when I stop class and either, you know, discuss it right there or I take the person who was doing it and we're going to have a talk immediately. Like that's not going to be something I'm going to wait 10 seconds on. I'm not going to wait to the end of class. Uh, that's something I'm addressing right then and there when it happens. So those types of things, I think, like you said, I think are just embedded in what we do. 
Um, and it's just, there are so many ways too that you can put kids into positions where, okay, you want to laugh at that? Let's, let's do this. Let me put a, uh, let me put a field hockey stick in your hand there, homeboy. <laughs> Mr. Basketball player, let's see how you do with a field hockey stick and watch this girl just toast you or, <laughs> or vice versa. You know, Mr. Mm -hmm. Football player, let's see. Let's see how you do against Mr. Basketball player, you know, in um, in Foursquare. Mm -hmm. so, so anytime that somebody if, if, if I ever saw where somebody thought like they were that, that was it, like they were the hot shot of the class, we can we can fix that if we have to. Um, but we don't, you know, I never, I never had to do that because most of our kids were pretty good about realizing this isn't about me. You know, I, my, my, one of my favorite expressions was today's not about you day. It's not, it's not going to be about you day today. Today's about all of us. We're all in this together. Um, beginning of class, a lot of times, almost, almost all the time, I would ask students questions. Uh, it was, we call it the QOD, the question of the day. And I would ask them a question and we'd get everybody's response. And as soon as somebody over here was talking, I immediately addressed that. And I addressed it not as you need to be quiet. That, that didn't have anything to do with it. You need to be quiet because somebody else in your class is talking and I want you to know, I, I want everybody to know what their response is. And so at the end of the question of the day, I would say, okay, um, favorite, favorite ice cream flavors was the topic. What's Joey's favorite ice cream player? What's Susan's favorite ice cream player? What's Veronica's favorite ice cream player? What's, you know, whoever, Yolanda's. And so everybody, would, we would go around and people would, and if I saw somebody who wasn't paying attention or wasn't talking, I purposely would say to them, Joey, what's, uh, what's, what's Samantha's favorite ice cream flavor? Well, all of a sudden he would pay attention the next day. Um, so it, I think it's just a matter of getting kids to know how to work together. And that is in everything that we do too. So, you know, project adventure type of thing, you put that across the board. It's in everything we do, I think. So, Yeah, Chip, you make a good point because I hear a lot of us in our field saying kids don't have good communication skills. Oof, yeah. They lack the interpersonal skills, especially with the technology devices. Uh, yeah, yeah. Their mode of communication is a text message and email. So we're losing that skill. We actually have to teach kids that skill of appropriate communication. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just really making eye contact with somebody who's talking. Oh yeah. It could be that simple of teaching kids that. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Teaching that's them, teaching them how, to, how to shake somebody's hand. Look yeah. Look the eye and shake hands and say, remember that you, you're gonna need to go get a job. And I, you know, and I, I used to tell them about my principal who I, I was in on the, the hiring committee for our, print, for our new principal. And she was already somebody in the district that everybody knew. Literally everybody at the table knew. And they were probably about 14 or 15. It's a pretty intimidating thing. You sat at the end of the table, the principal to be sat at the end of the table and they got grilled by 15 people. It was pretty tough. Wow. So most of them would just come in and sit down and they would nope. Brooke went and shook everybody's hand and said, How are you? My name's Brooke. And, and she went around and she and she almost remembered everybody's names when she was addressing people. So she not only A, shook hands properly, looked you in the eye, so now you had a connection with her, but also she probably knew your name. Now, if she knew your name and you, she was talking to you with your name, whew, and she, that, she, she was halfway through her interview before anybody even listened to what she was saying. So yeah, wow. she, she was really good at it and she got the job. Huh. Rightfully so. Yeah. so this is a perfect segue uh, into our into our next question. So when you are thinking about creating and designing lessons, right, whether it's fitness based, skill based, you know, project adventure, you know, what is your approach on how, how you create and design those? So all this stuff that you just said, a good lesson is going to have all that, right? A good lesson is going to have some fitness. It's going to have some project adventure or or team building type of thing. Even if it's, even if you're doing basketball, you know, you can do a, a cooperative or a competitive basketball game. That's going to have a team approach where the kids are going to have to work together and communicate, like you said. Um, and it's probably going to have some kind of fitness involved. You're going to have skill involved. Um, so a, a, a great lesson is going to hopefully address all that stuff. Everything is going to be in one. 
But you you know, because you've heard me say this probably a thousand times, that what's the overarching theme of it? It better be, better be fun. <laughs> better be having fun. Because if the kids ain't having fun, we're not having fun. That's right. We're going to get burned out. We're going to retire. We're going to be grouchy and grumpy. So if the kids aren't having fun, we're not having fun. And it, And guess what? They're not going to want to do it for a lifetime. If we are teaching, if we really are saying that we're trying to get kids to be healthy and movement oriented for the rest of their lives, all, all we want them to do is to understand that they've got to have some type of movement and, um, you know, some other healthy habits for the rest of their lives. If we really believe that, we're not going to teach it within our class. We've got to bring it into our class, show them, and then they've got to go do it because they like it because they like to do it. If you don't like to run, you're probably not going to run. Mm. If you don't like, but if you don't like to run, then hopefully you find cycling. And if you don't like to cycle, hopefully you find walking. You find something that you enjoy. So the other thing, the other, the other thing on that was, um, we said within the three years that they were in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we wanted them to be exposed to as many different things as possible exposure try try everything and like you said when you put a a tennis racket into a soccer player's hands you never know what's going to happen um perfect example of that was we had a girl who she was an outstanding athlete she was a really 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 good soccer player a pretty good basketball player um, and she was in with a bunch of girls who were also very good it was a really talented group not a very necessarily a nice group, but they were really talented. And this girl was, uh, we, we, we started a racket unit. We did basically a low court tennis type of thing, indoor tennis. She was unbelievable. She, she, was, she wound up being a school champion and it wasn't even close. And she had never had a tennis racket in her hand before. And there were lots of kids, lots of girls in, in that school. And I'm, you know, I'm saying girls, guys, because we had a girls tournament, the guys tournament. Lots of the girls in the school were already taking lessons and it was obvious they knew how to hit their two hand backhand. And I mean, they were doing everything. She was killing everybody. She's hitting it short, hitting it long. The point was that she found out something that she was good at because it was just a different, a, a different approach. I don't know if she went on to do it, but she realized she was good at it. And that's what we need. Every kid's got to find something that they're good at, something that they want to do and do it for the rest of their lives. So. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with everything you're saying, you know, and, you know, by adopting that style, by infusing and including all those different approaches, you're equaling the playing field for everybody. Mm -hmm. So they're finding their niche, right, of something that they really enjoy doing and hopefully they, they pursue or maybe something they never tried before. And now they're like, I'm actually pretty good at this. Mm -hmm. And then they start to take a different angle. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I totally 100 percent in agreement with you on that. Mm -hmm. You know, and Chip, it's, it's funny, some of the stuff you say there is. You know, one of the things that I like to do as a PE teacher was expose kids to as many things as they could do that's outside of the school. So that if they found something they loved in my class, they can sign up for it outside. And, you know, exactly what you said there with, with, with the girl who likes playing tennis is there's nothing more rewarding in this job when that kid comes up to you and goes, thank you for showing me how to play that. I love it. And that is like our biggest Okay, now I know. I now I know my purpose. I mean, not that we don't have other reasons, but that's really it. That's our sense of accomplishment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so um, to to piggyback off of that, when I retired, um, they did some pretty nice stuff for me. I was really, I mean, I was spoiled. And but the coolest thing that they did, I didn't know they were doing this, was they went and and set up a um, a Facebook page for all of all of my former students oh. and, they, and they could all weigh in on stuff well it wound up not being uh like you know thank you mr candy type of thing it wound up being a basically a um kind of a meeting place for everybody and a re like remembering crazy goofy stuff that we did there was stuff on there i swear I'm, I'm not lying to you there was stuff that they put on there and i thought to myself i don't remember that at all I don't remember that game. And there was a whole string of on one of them. And it was like, I, I don't even remember what that game was. I can't even, I couldn't tell you how we played it. I think I remember we played it, but I don't even remember the, I can't remember how to play the game. It was that many years ago. They said that 
um, as elementary kids in the elementary school, they get to get, they still get together, the elementary school kids. Like the, when they come home from college, they don't get together with their high school crew, they get together with their elementary school kids. And they, so this stuff is like, they all rehash all this crazy, weird, goofy stuff. Dance was huge. Like we did dance all the time. We had dances, not only in our school, but at our Y camp that was, was in town. And so we did these, we did these dances, you know, I mean, I was doing two or three dances literally a month and, yeah. you know, seventh and eighth graders and sixth graders. And so we had these dances all the time. Well, all of them talk about going to weddings and still doing, you know, dancing, you know, thank you for, thank you for the fact that we learned how to dance. Like, you know, it's just something that you, hopefully they pick up one kid, one, as crazy as this sounds, one boy, he went on to, um, to hip hop dance and um, you know, just he started, literally started at our school doing hip hop stuff, was in a talent, was in our talent show that we, we, we built. Um, and um, what the, this, his eighth grade year, the other person who did it with me, the, the music teacher who was the coolest lady in the world, we basically said, listen, you, you got it. We're gonna let you do, you've got the last, how, how long do you need? He said, can I have 10 minutes? We said, you got 10 minutes. He put this thing together and it was just awesome. And he wind, so he winds up being like the Michael Jackson. I think he was in a Michael Jackson video. He's in a Coke video. Yeah. Well, speaking of Michael Jackson, you were like, to me, when you taught the dance thriller, huh. because that's one of your, like, I, I think that's one of your signature dances that you did at some of the conferences. And you did it in such an easy way. I mean, I couldn't wait to get back. For those who are fearful of teaching dance and ryth rhythmic activities, that was one of my funnest units, and I'm not even a dancer. I me. like to move, and I like to groove. And you sh and you shared how easy it was. Now that's that's actually a JD Hughes game. Uh, yeah. That I think I don't know. I I'm not even sure if I do it exactly like JD does it, but um, yeah. I mean, it was a JD Hughes dance, and I just used it for my kids, and they, yeah. I mean, they used obviously they danced all the they love that one. They do it at weddings all the time. Like you'll, I'll go to a wedding, and there'll be some some kid busted out and I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Wow. All right. Well, speaking of some of your favorite memories um, that you probably didn't even realize how and what an impact you made with some of your kids, especially, I love that Facebook group page that they created for oh, you. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, to be able to read some of those comments and to be reminded of the value of what we do as a PE teacher and to see some of those comments. I mean, you, your heart must've been so full reading those comments and what a great, I mean, can you still go to that page and see some yeah. of those posts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. That's that's a great retirement gift. It, it is. And I would highly recommend if you know anybody retiring to figure yeah. out a way to do it because it was it was very cool. And like I said, it wasn't it wasn't that people like they were applauding me or thanking me or it was it, it really wasn't about me at all. It was about them. Mm -hmm. They all got into this thing and like there'd be one string that would go you know, 20, 30 people would weigh in on one string of, oh my gosh, yeah. And it was like, I, I just had fun reading it just because it brought back so many memories. It was just, it was really a memory page more than anything. It was sure. really, yeah. So Chip, what is uh, one of your favorite yeah. teaching memories or experiences that you had in your 37 years? That's a loaded question. This whole yeah. podcast could be just based on that. And there may be a podcast number two, just on this question. Okay. Um, um, I, I'll try to do, I'll, I'll do one quick and then if I have time, if you want me to do another one, I'll do another one. So I'll give you the funniest day that happened in, in, in class. It, it, I still to this day, I can remember being doubled over and almost not being able to breathe. So we're seventh grade, we got the boys in the locker room and we're coming out and a couple of the boys come over and say, you know what, we, we know how to play basketball. Do we really have to go through all the skill stuff and all that other you know, rules and all those things? Can we just play? So I, we, you know, Tom, my, my buddy Tom and I, we look at each other and go, yeah, sure. We think we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. So we start playing. Well, right before we start playing, a girl comes over to me and says, hey, uh, Mr. Candy, listen, I'm, I'm not real comfortable with this. I don't, I don't really know that much about basketball and I'm not really, I'm not really that good. Can I, can I just sit and watch for a little while? I'm like, sure, sure. You, you can do that if you'd like. So she goes and sits down. Well, we, we start the game, and within about 30 seconds, Tom's over on the other side of the court, and I'm on this side of the court. We have tears coming down our eyes. We're laughing so hard. Um, dribbling was, was strictly optional in the game. 
<laughs> they, uh, they were they were carrying it like a handbag. Um, first shot literally is a Scud missile. <laughs> over, the top, over the top of the backboard, hits nothing. The next two or three, and we're afraid, like, we're literally afraid we're not going to have a backboard left. They're banging off of there so hard. And, and I'm telling you, like, out of bounds, they had no concept of out of bounds. But, like, there was no... There was no rhyme to reason. Every every single play was a foul. I mean, it was just it was bad. Um, after about two minutes, the girl comes back over to me and she says, "You know what? I can play this well. I'm going to go ahead and play it." <laughs> At that point, I was already in tears. At that point, I literally, I literally lost it. I had to, like, I, I think I had to go into the locker room for a breath. I could I couldn't, I could barely breathe. I was laughing so hard. Um, but let me let me give you one more. Uh, this is more please more of a poignant one. So we we were doing dance, and um, we I would do about probably a thirty minute lesson, um, literally talking to kids about the, the the mechanics of a dance. Like when we go to a dance, what's expected? You know, everything from how do you ask somebody to dance? How do you dance with them to be comfortable? Um, what's the you know what's the style of that? Um, not saying no to someone, you know, why, why we would not say no to someone, um, and just on and on and on. And there were lots and lots of parts to it. And it went everything from funny to serious to basically set up dances. So we're into this, this thing called a multiplication dance. We start with two kids. They slow dance. I say switch. They go get two people. They come on. We now have four. I say switch. They come down. We have eight. And it just keeps going like that. They used to call it snowball dance. Okay. So we're partway through it and the coolest kid in the, in the class, I still, I, I mean, I can tell you who he was, but I don't, I don't want to embarrass him on, on this in case he's ever listening. Cause one of his, his, one of his, I think one of somebody in his family is a phys ed teacher. But anyway, he came to me and he said, um, how would we ask this other girl who was in the class who was in a wheelchair, how to dance? So I was like, time out, time out. Let's figure this out. So we went over and we said, listen, if somebody were to dance with you, what would you feel comfortable with? How would you feel comfortable? And she said, well, you know, she was in a, she was in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She wasn't, like, she wasn't injured. Um, and they, she said, you know, I'd feel comfortable if I did this and did this and I can move my wheelchair and so forth. And so Johnny C, John C. Rath, I'll, I'll never forget it. He, he, he started with her and next thing you know, for the rest of her, at least eighth grade, I think it probably started in seventh grade, she never, never was without somebody dancing with her in the class, at, in, in the dances we had. And that went for another student who was going totally blind. And we realized when he was out on the floor, when it was dark, he couldn't see anything. Wow. Off the floor, he, where there was a little bit of light around the outside, he could see. Well, the, the main light was right where I was, DJ. So I was over there as the DJ. And this kid used to hang by me all the time, and I could never figure out why. And then all of a sudden, a girl came over and asked him to dance, and he said, if, if I can dance right here. All of a sudden, it hit me like he couldn't see out there. Wow. So once students knew, they just started taking him out and then bringing him back and taking him out and bringing him back. And again, he danced with everybody and almost every, probably every girl. And the, best, the coolest part about it, the best part about that story was he didn't care what they looked like. He was just dancing. It didn't matter what the girl was. It didn't matter what her personality was. It didn't matter what what size, shape, color. It did nothing matter to him because he really couldn't see him. He was just able to dance, and he loved it. So that was those were some of the cooler ones. I mean, I, there are there are lots of others, but those are those are a couple of the cool ones. Well, that's uh, SEL at its finest, right there. Oh yeah, and and by the way, dance. Speaking of that, yeah, dance is SEL like. To the, to the utmost. It really is. If you teach it correctly and you teach kids how to interact with each other, that's like SEL on steroids. Yeah, but that's your making sure that they feel safe and they feel safe to take risks. Yeah. And it's that that's it's that environment that you created to allow them to basically dance like no one's watching. <laughs> so, all right, well, we're going to end the serious part of the Pizza and Pea podcast on those like last favorite memories, teaching memories that you had, because 
Um, I'm going to reflect on those after this podcast. So we want to go to a not so serious segment called Rapid Fire Segment. All right now, Chip. Now we've been to a lot of conferences and we know that you're quick on your feet when you're out there dancing it up with, you know, all the people there, or, you know, teaching them. But this segment here is quick fire. We're going to just throw you some questions. You got to give us the first thing that comes to your mind. We can elaborate later, but let's just go with the first thing that comes to your mind. So I'm going to start because now Andrew and I have come up with these questions. Kim hasn't heard any of them, so she doesn't have a clue. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> All right. This one, and it could be it. This is going to be any topic now. So we'll start with this one. Ready? Great Adventure or Action Park? Oh, Great Adventure. Okay. Uh, better social media follow: Chip Kelly, Chip Gaines, or Chip Candy? <laughs> Chip Gaines. I love me some Chip Gaines. I love that show. Okay. Best and or favorite Triple D restaurant. Well, okay, you know what one is one of my fa absolute favorites, Crazy Fish, that you and I went to. Um, Crazy Fish in Charlotte is one of the best. Um, they just had another one on. It was out in California. Um, Maria's? No. Um, oh, I can't remember the name. I think it's Maria. Maybe it is Maria's. But, it, yeah, it was Salvadorian food. Oh, it was out of this world. I've been to – so for those who don't know the Triple Ds, that's diners, drive-ins, and dives, and I've been to about 100 – I think I'm over 135 now that I've been to. Every time I go on the road, I try to go to one. But Crazy Fish in Charlotte. The Dish in Charlotte um, – there's another one in Charlotte. There's a there's a, a taco place down in the Art District. Oh, um, oh Cabo Fish Taco. Yes, Cabo Fish Taco. Ooh, ooh, killer. Love that place. Mm -hmm. What's the hot dog place, too? The hot dog place. JJ Red Hots. Yes. And they have, aren't those, aren't those hot dogs from Buffalo? From Buffalo, New York. Really I'm from Rochester. So those, it's Zweigel's Hot Dogs. Those are, that's an amazing place. And there was also, there was a, another a bar in Charlotte that I went to that had, oh, tremendous bar food. It was near, it was near that place. It was near the hot dog place. Lebowski's? You, what's it, what's it called? Lebowski's? Yes. Yes. Tremendous. Yes. Yes. All of those are triple D's too, by the way. Yeah. Lebowski, Lebowski's is a Buffalo Bills uh, backer bar. So they sell all the Buffalo food, beef on whack, chicken wings. So that's my go-to place when I watch the Buffalo Bills games. Yeah. Tremendous. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So Chip, who's the most famous person you ever taught? Ever taught? Um, wow. Let me think here. Let me think. Okay, I, I got, okay, this, this is actually a cool one. Um, I taught the first third generation baseball players, pro baseball players in the history of the sport. Who are they? Do you know? Yes, it's uh, Yankees manager. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm a bit, we're baseball guys. We should know this. Aaron. Oh, the Boone's, the Boone, the Boone brothers. So I, we taught, I taught Aaron and Brett Boone. Now they, they're, those are athletes. We've had others. We've had some others that have been ridiculous. Uh, doctors, lawyers. I mean, we've had some really, we've had some pretty wild stuff. Um, there were, there was an Olympian in there. There've been some other, they're pro soccer. I had two pro soccer players. Um, so we've had some, we've had some pretty cool ones, but yeah, I would say Aaron and Brett Boone. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah, Bob was a big Phillies guy, so we know that. Yeah, well, he was he was he, he was living here. Okay, so I got to tell you, ten seconds story. He was living here, so I taught the kids. They were in my school. They got he got traded to uh, Los Angeles, which he wanted to be. He, he's fr he's actually from out that way. Um, so he got traded to to the uh, Angels, and he winds up going to the their kids wind up going to the school of one of my best friends in California. To, he, they go and we never knew it. We were in a conference one time. We were doing "Have You Ever?" and we were asking, "Have you ever taught somebody famous?" He goes before me and says, "I taught the first third generation baseball players in the history of baseball. I'm next." And I'm like, <laughs> got, I looked at him. I said, "You've got to be kidding me!" They moved from my school to his school. Yep. That's wow. Cool. Yeah, it was crazy. All right, ready? Uh, the Boss or Bon Jovi? Oh, that's not even close. Come on, stop it with that. I love Bon Jovi, but bo the boss is the boss, man. Come on. Is double dipping at a party ever acceptable? No. <laughs> Sorry. No, sir. No. No. Get, get, this, get the guacamole and put it on your plate. 
Okay, so now this is where you're in a unique situation like I was growing up being from Connecticut. Okay, we don't have anything right in state. So, New York sports teams or Philly sports teams? Come on, that's again, that's not even close. I'm from I'm from South Jersey. There is not, we don't we hate New York sports teams. I am a total 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 Philadelphia fan. Flyers I'm I'm what we call in this area a 4 for 4. Me four, too. I'm a four for four guy, Chip. Four for four guy is Philly right. Flyers, Sixers, and the Eagles. That's correct. Great answer. Only one answer to that. You wow. win. Now, so you might you may need to know that New Jersey, if you cut New Jersey in half, it's already a small state, but if you cut it in half, everything north is New York. It's all people that talk like this and it and they all vote for the Giants and the Jets and the and the Yankees and so forth. Everything south is we talk like normal people and we're Philadelphia fans. <laughs> Well, then you know Connecticut, we have that same line. You're either all Boston or you're all New York. So what are you? So I always considered myself a free agent, so I'm all over the place. Uh, uh. <laughs> Oakland A's fan, a Washington Redskins fan. The only team I ever liked that was local was the Hartford Whalers. And then when they moved to North Carolina, I refused to like them anymore. Yeah. You weren't a, you weren't a Sox fan? Nope. Oh, so I, I, that's, my, that's, my other, that's my other favorite team is at Boston. But I think it's because I love the city of Boston. Well, see, growing up in Connecticut, my dad used to get tickets to Yankee games, but we would only get the AL West from his suppliers. Yeah. Because Boston and all of them were in the same conference. We couldn't get those. Sure. And Oakland always came Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Wow. We wanted to go midweek. So we would get all three. Now, growing up, I was a huge McGuire, Conseco fan, oh, Henderson yeah. fan. So nobody throws anything at you in Yankee Stadium when you come as an A's fan because they know that those guys are going to be playing in Yankee pinstripes. Yeah. That's right. Wow. I have a question, though. What's your favorite marathon that you ran? Oh, uh, New York. New York City. Wow. New York was absolutely unbelievable. 35,000 people um, the year that we did it. Um, they said there were 2.5 million people along the course um, once you run across, the first thing you do is you run across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which is absolutely stunning bridge. It's down at the, um, you know, down at the end of the island. So you, you saw where the World Trade Centers were. You can see the Statue of Liberty. You can see, you can see the whole island. Once you get across there, there's never a spot where there aren't people along the sides of the roads. And in some places, they're six to eight deep, especially in the, when you come off the bridge and go into Central. How about you, Boston? Right. I probably well, the same kind of feeling, but there are people that say that they like New York um, better than Boston. Not to take away from Boston because they are so proud of that marathon and they're six to eight deep too. And anywhere on the course, you've got people and spectators cheering and giving you orange slices. And it's a, it's a hub of pride yeah. in Boston. So oh, yeah. I don't want to say that because I, but I don't, I've never ran New York. Mm -hmm. So, and I heard Chicago is a good one too. I didn't get to run Boston. I qualified and didn't get to run it. That's when I hurt my back and oh. I was going to run it and we were going to run it that year. We got in my, and my son got in in the same race in Philly and we were going to run it together. And um, I got my back hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we couldn't run it. He, he wound up running it. So I didn't get to run, but I get to watch him run it. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. So I know you're uh, you know, you love your socks, not the team, just socks in general. Uh, so what are your favorite pair of socks that you own? Okay, one of mine are, I'm wearing, I'm, I, I always have pretty crazy on I don't know if you can see this one. Yeah. It's a snake, the blue snake. But now, I, I, I don't know if that's my favorite. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to go, uh, no vote, because as they wear out, I just get a new pair. I had a pair that were red hot chili peppers. They were, that was pretty cool. I like those. Wow. What's we'll your socks with your, your picture on it? What's that? We'll have to make some socks with your picture on it. Yeah, right. We can sure. make that happen for sure. But yeah. If we'll make a pair of socks with Kim's face on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. For us listeners, for those listeners out there, this crew, including Chip Candy, <laughs> like to wear t shirts with my image on it. So I, I keep telling you that. And it said, I know Kim Morton, and it yeah. had your face on it. That was classic. We all, I mean, there were a lot of us wearing them that day. That was a fun day. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get the humor in it. I'm <laughs> like, take it off. <laughs> we, 
We got it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, this is not funny. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Chip, I can't thank you enough for coming on to this second episode of the Pizza and PE podcast. Every time I have a conversation with you or being in a session that you're leading, I learn something new. I'm constantly inspired by you. You have been one of my biggest influences. And I want to say it probably, gosh, top three, you, Kurt Henson, Mike Kazala, Gene Blades, you are up there, you have shaped everything that I've done in my teaching career. And one of the biggest things that I love from you is you were always in the game. <laughs> you were always a learner yourself and you always wanted to just, um, you never wanted to quit. You, you, you always had enthusiasm for the, the profession. And that is something that is so admirable and respectful that I'm so glad that we're able to have you on and just honestly, just to say thank you. I know over a computer, but live or, and you know, I want, I want everybody in the PE world to know what a, a tremendous person you are most importantly, but as a PE teacher and the legacy that you have created and are leaving for everybody else to basically, I, I feel a huge burden with the baton that's that you hand off to people to say, okay, um, now do good. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, like I said, I got the baton from a whole bunch of other people. You know, they, it, what's that line in the uh, Tim McGraw song? Once you get to the top, reach back down and help the next person up. Um, that's what it is. It's all everybody's just helping each other back up the ladder. Wow. So well, I can tell you, you know, it's it, after seeing you uh, share the wealth, it was, that was my first experience. And I, I haven't stopped coming to your session since. <laughs> and learning every time I go there. Um, but I think the, the, the biggest and most important thing to me is that I actually get to call you a friend. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and when I see you at conferences that we have conversations and I just get to listen to your stories because it's, you know, it's, it, they're all awesome. And those are the things I, I look forward to when I go to a conference and then you know, as I've gotten to know you and, and of course, John Smith, you guys like to, you know, pick on me a little bit during your sessions, which is fine because it's a good time. And that to me just is, is great. I mean, I know I get to be a, you know, an example, but it's great. And that means that I mean something to you guys as well. So that's, that's important. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it goes without saying every time I go to a conference, one of the first persons I look for is where's chip session you know, mm -hmm. scrolling down because every time I go, it doesn't matter how many times I've seen a game, which you don't do very often. You don't really ever teach the same things twice. You always have something new and creative, but it's not what you teach necessarily, even though they're phenomenal. It's how you do it. It's how you go about it. And you invite everybody in and you grab their attention and you hook them within the first three, five seconds. It's unbelievable that you have that ability just to be able to hook them and boom, and you go and I, I've never seen so many people engaged and having fun and laughing and enjoying the time than when they're at your sessions. You know, so you're to be commended on that because, like you said, you learn from so many great ones. And you took a little bit of each one and made it your own. And it's it's absolutely phenomenal. So thank mm -hmm. you for everything you've done. Thank yeah. you. Th thank you for having me. And for those people who have not seen you three present, <laughs> that is something that you must do I, I i am the same way with the three of you anytime i see you on any in, in any any place that i go if i see any one of the three of you presenting i you know i'm there i, I, I mean i'm mm -hmm. seeing, i've seen you guys present i don't know how many times and it's always i'm always amazed thinking that, wow this is this is this is out of the box this is not anywhere near what i like i'm i'm not even thinking the way they're thinking it's like they're they're way out of the box on me right now and so I always get come away with amazingly cool stuff. And by the way, your first the first one you had, the first pizza and PE was really cool. And I hear the oh, next one. You. I heard the next one's not gonna go so well. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's what you're uh, we basically have your brother who's gonna be on, Dr. Kurt <laughs> Henson for Pizza and PE Podcast Three. So that's if those who are listening, um, Chip and uh, Dr. Kurt Henson go back a long way. And so every time we see them in the conferences. They just go back and forth. And I love the little bantering back and forth between the two of you guys. So the little bantering comes from him because, well, he's little. 
<laughs> yeah. well, I could imagine having the two of you both on. That might be another pizza and oh, pizza. Okay. That would be, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Oh my god. That'd goodness. be more of a roast than it will be a podcast. We roasting each other. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> We, we, you have to mute Kurt's uh, mic every now and then because you know once he hurts, he's going to stop. Oh, my goodness. Well, Chip, we don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate the time that you did give us. And for um, for the listeners, we thank you for um, basically paying attention to Pizza and PE podcast episode number two. Candy PE guy, you are the goat. No way. but that's the Greatest of all time, Chip. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, Chip. Bye, Chip. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. You guys are the best. Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. Wow, you guys. Yep. So before we end the PMPE podcast, just a few takeaways. Um, one of the things that resonated with me right away is just how humble Chip is. I'm constantly reminded of that. He's not a look at me guy. He's so humble. And one of the things I did not know about him that he shared with us is I loved how he used or, or had his students be the voice and guidance for the activities that he was teaching in some of the presentations. That he constantly had it kid tested, kid approved, and he actually for kid advice. So I loved that part of the Pizza and PE podcast. You know, for me, there's so many things to digest in there other than the pizza that we're eating. And um, I really think I go, I reflect back on the beginning of my career and thinking I had to do everything. I had to sign up for every event at school, had to do everything. And when he talked about the burnout piece where it's like, when I come home, I really need to be home. I mean, I can take some stuff home, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's true because, you know, when we first get into this, we do think we have to be on every PTA committee, a coach everything that we can and be a part of everything. And it, it gets cumbersome really quick. And then you forget that you really need to take care of yourself and all that. And that to me was one of those things that really stuck. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for me, like he said, there's so much, you know, to, to digest from, from what he just said too. Um, but the two things he said early on that really grabbed my attention is if we really think about the influence that we have on kids and how far that can go and how many kids that we actually are able to teach and touch. And we have no idea the impact that we make on them. But if we provide a fun, engaging, quality type education for these kids, they'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. And they can go on and they can share that with others. So to me, that's Absolutely phenomenal. And then when he said, you know, one thing that always stuck with him is I don't have to teach. I get to teach. You know, we get an opportunity every day to get in front of our students and really have an impact. No matter how bad our day is going, we're always out in front in front of those kids to give them the best chance possible to be happy, to be successful, you know, to bring them out of that negative state and into that positive state that we always talk about. So, you know, when we think about it in those terms, it's just absolutely phenomenal and what an impact he has had in his career. And I hope that I can have that same impact, you know, when I get to be to, to that point of my retirement. Could you imagine being a student in his class, you guys? That had to be the best part of a student's day. I couldn't imagine being a student in his class. There's that saying that we've all heard before, it's not what you teach, it's how you teach and how it makes you feel is what's really important. Those kids, the way that Chip delivers his lessons and activities with a bit of humor, with the eye contact, and he, 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 the way he looks at you, you know that you are a valued person. You are important. And yeah. to have those middle school students, especially, mm -hmm. to feel that way, especially at that age, like that is so impactful that just to be able to, um, to let a kid know that they're good stuff. Yeah. And like you said, too, like that's why I had to say to him, you know, it's not just what you do, Chip, at these conferences that we go to. It's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Like your how is so impactful. It, it's so, like you make everybody feel like they're the most important person there. Yeah. And I know that's what you do with your students. You know, you can tell how he does it there is how exactly how he did it with his kids. You know, so. And he learned from an art teacher, too. One of his mentors who guided him, it wasn't, yes, he had a great PE squad and crew that they collaborated with,
but he instantly said to us, one of his influences was an art teacher. So as PE teachers, sometimes we just look within our own subject where I was able to pick up some of my instructional delivery styles by observing a first grade teacher, a music teacher, a math teacher, is stepping outside our subject and not even looking at the content, but look how it's delivered. How content is delivered is key. It's key. And he, 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 he's, that's why I think he's one of the goats. <laughs> so, all right, you guys, are we, uh, I'm out of pizza. I'm on my last. I'm taking my last bite. All right. Well, this is the end of the show. And for next episode, episode number three of the Pizza and PE podcast, we have Dr. Kurt Hinson, AKA Dr. Recess. So for you to be able to watch this, if those who are listening, please just search in YouTube, just type in Pizza and PE or go to our Trainee DU YouTube channel for Pizza and PE. And um, this podcast is on most podcast platforms, Spotify, um, Google Podcasts. And of course, we'll be tweeting this out. And please follow us at CMSHPE, at Train EDU. And of course, please follow our guest at Candy PE Guy, Chip Candy, the one and only, the GOAT. Slice you later. Ciao.